or welcome to this overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapters 19 and 20. David's son becomes his Lord. What is going on in this clip? Now, why should we learn from Jesus? Well, for one thing, today we and our youth have become subject to the tactics and strategies of cognitive warfare. This includes neuro-linguistic programming leading to mass psychosis. Because powerful non-elect men are actively manipulating our thoughts, beliefs, and emotions. These psychological operations make us fearful, compliant, or obedient to unseen authorities. Thus, the gospel of Jesus remains our best defense, providing us with credible alternative truth. Our lesson outline includes the following seven points. Leaders seek to kill Jesus. They doubt Jesus' authority. And he doubts theirs. So these leaders seek to entrap him while Jesus corrects their beliefs. He queries their beliefs and then warns his disciples. What does this have to do with Roman armies? As a background to this passage, we note that religious leaders sought to suppress popular preachers partly because everyone remembered the disastrous tax revolt of the year 6 when soldiers slaughtered so many citizens. Now we know that much of the land was owned by the wealthy who would rent it out to tenant farmers. If a man died in a vineyard, then this would defile the fruit, making it inedible and unsaleable. What is this young man doing? Why are we showing this? Now, foreign coins bore the emperor's image and the divine status that they claimed. Jews believed that angels do not procreate because God can create new ones. Jews understood that many psalms spoke about their awaited Messiah. Oh, here we go. God deplores those who perform religious duties to be seen by others. Part 1. Leaders seek to kill Jesus. What was Jesus doing in the temple? When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, said he to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. It is written signals that these words are quoted from the First Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Reference to my house from Isaiah in the ninth century and a den of robbers from Jeremiah in the sixth century. What is Jesus doing in the temple? Every day he was teaching at the temple but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders amongst the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do so because all the people hung on his words. Kill him? Why? What for? Perhaps because he claimed to be the awaited Messiah? Did they fear that the Romans might intervene? Part 2. Leaders Doubt Jesus' Authority One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. I tell us by what authority you are doing these things. Who gave you this authority? Well, what does this have to do with John the Baptist? Jesus replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed this amongst themselves and replied, Well, if we say from heaven, then he will ask, 
why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, then all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know where it was from. Say Jesus, Neither then will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Well, why did Jesus decline to assert his authority? Well, for one thing, he had already demonstrated it, and they had already rejected him. I think he also enjoyed outwitting the arrogant. Part 3. Jesus Doubts Their Authority What does this have to do with grapes? Jesus went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Is this perhaps the owner and his son? The owner sent still a second and later a third, whom they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. What Bible verse does this remind you of? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. Uh, this is the inheritor, the heir. Let's just kill him, then the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. By current law, if a landowner died and had no inheritor, then tenants could assume ownership. So why throw the man out and then kill him when they had beaten other men before throwing them out? Well, had the man died in the vineyard, then the fruit would have become unclean and could be neither sold nor eaten. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid! Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? Then Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Now everyone knew that this was a reference to the awaited Messiah. Quoted from Isaiah chapter 8, written in the 10th century BCE. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest Jesus immediately because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Part 4. Leaders seek to entrap Jesus. Now the governor at the time was Pontius Pilate, whose identity has been found in this carving discovered at an archaeological site of Caesarea Maritima. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. The governor was, of course, Pontius Pilate, who would later condemn Jesus to death. What are these men holding in their hand? Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right 
and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, Jesus saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius. Now, whose image and inscription are on it? Well, Caesar's. Here is a denarius, coined in about the year 41 BCE. At the time of Jesus, a denarius was the daily wage of a Roman soldier. So Jesus then said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public, and astonished by their answer, they became silent. Jesus corrects those leaders' beliefs. What does this have to do with a Jewish wedding? Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a query. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? At the resurrection. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die. They are God's children. In Greek, literally, the sons of God. Who were the sons of God in the First Testament? That was a class of spirit beings who rebelled against Yahweh. Well, who were or are the sons of God in the New Testament? It is all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who become the replacement sons of God. Part 6. Jesus queries leaders' beliefs. Now, before we continue, let's review seven messianic titles cited in the Gospel of Luke. In alphabetical order, he will be called King of the Jews, Lord, Messiah or Christ, Savior, Son of David, Son of God, and Son of Man. Then Jesus said to them, Why is it said that the Messiah is Son of David? For David himself declares in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In the English Bible, it looks as though the Lord is speaking to himself. So let's examine this. First, in the Hebrew, marking two words translated Lord in different colors. We note that those in blue color, we note that the name in blue color is Yahweh, whereas the one in red color is Adon, a literal translation, Declaration of Yahweh to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord, so how can he be David's son? Well, let's review a few biblical terms for divinity. The singular El and the plural Elohim always refer to Israel's God. In the book of Exodus, the Elohim reveals his personal name, Yahweh, which means he is or exists. Another name for God in the Hebrew Bible is Adonai. It is also a plural in form, but again refers to Israel's God. Whereas Adon, E, is a singular, my Lord, which in Psalm 110 is a reference to the future Messiah. When David was born and had his own son, God said that a descendant of David 
would be the Messiah. So, Messiah is both David's son and David's Lord. Finally, Jesus warns his disciples. Why is Jesus pointing to these men? While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and in the places of honor at banquets. To this day, in countries where there is a dominant religion, religious leaders love to take baths, wear oversized clothes, and to be honored in public. Some will even pray in public where others can see them. However, they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Punished? Why? When? Where? How? Scripture says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Religious men would lend money to poor widows who could never repay it and then seize their property. What did you discover in this lesson? What truth could you affirm? What promise could you claim? What commands must you obey? Your assignment for next time is to read Luke chapter 21, wherein Jesus foretells the future. Visit the website to see other materials or to download these slides. As you do so, compile your insights, queries, and observations to share with others.